So with that, I'd like to move forward on to our third and final disaster innovation talk uh, for NGPS this year. And I have the, the privilege of inviting uh, Laura McGorman up uh, to join us today. She is the policy lead for disaster maps at Facebook. So a totally different perspective, something new and emerging coming out of the private sector and specifically with our social media partners. I had the opportunity of meeting Laura actually just recently back in August in DC, uh, right before we hit into another serious hurricane season and got to see some of the data and, that they're analyzing and producing in maps specifically for use by emergency management and first responders. And we were really excited about this and over the past couple of months we've, we've worked diligently with all of our respective uh, attorneys and whatnot to <laughs> reach a data sharing agreement that protects that data but will hopefully open that up and make it more accessible for our partners such as you all to be able to use. So we're still trying to figure out what that means and what that looks like. So I wanted Laura to come up, give this disaster innovation talk, and also generate some discussion with you all. So I'd encourage you, uh, and I will come back up and help moderate questions, but please use this also as a very engaging session. And with that, Laura. Uh, thanks so much, Rebecca. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in front of so many uh, esteemed public servants, and it's an honor to, to be able to work in this space with you all. So my name is Laura McGorman. I manage the Data for Good program at Facebook. And um, I thought when I was asked to give a TED Talk style presentation, I thought, you know, what is that about? Um, it's supposed to maybe change ideas, maybe push people to think in a different direction. And when I thought about social media data and the space it occupies in the data landscape, it occurred to me that people probably think about social media data as, as pretty narrow, potentially, in the way that it can be used. Um, and, and my goal here is to maybe think about the ways in which other technological advancements have also been viewed in, in a fairly narrow format, and maybe what that can tell us about how we might consider broadening the use of social media data, particularly in this context. So to walk through one example from a very long time ago, um, something called the telephone. Uh, it used to look like this. Now it looks like this. And if you go back very, very long in history and you try to look at people's perspectives on the telephone, starting in the late 1800s, um, the president of Western Union at the time said that the telephone had too many shortcomings to seriously be considered as a means of communication. And you might say, well, you know, that was like 1876. You know, people were like probably scared by the telephone. It was very, very new. But if you advance even to 1981, this is a really funny quote um, from actually, actually the inventor of the first handheld cellular telephone. He himself said, cellular telephones will absolutely not replace local wire systems. So a pretty uh, humble inventor and, and, and fairly distrusting of his own invention. Okay, and you might say, well, that was the 80s, like cell phones were very new, people thought they were weird. But even as soon as uh, 2007, Steve Ballmer, the Microsoft CEO at the time, said that there was absolutely no chance that the iPhone was going to gain any significant market share. And so the telephone provides one example of you know, innovative technology where people were mistrusting and people didn't realize that it could be used for such a wide um, set of applications and, and be used for such important things that we all now know the telephone is used for today. To just provide one other very simple example uh, that is more recent, the internet also had some very funny things said about it when it first uh, met the scene. So in 1995, there was this landmark article written in uh, Newsweek entitled, The Internet, Bah! And uh, hype alert, why cyberspace isn't and will never be nirvana. And this guy, Clifford Stoll, uh, was quoting actually a very accurate uh, MIT professor named Nicholas Negroponte, who said that um, soon we would buy books and newspapers straight off the internet, to which the author said, yeah, mm -hmm, sure. Uh, that same year, Wired did an article that was actually talking about the specifics of US uh, uh, internet technology and how it was just too complicated because most things that uh, succeed don't require retraining 250 million people. And so again, when we use more recent examples of innovative technology, again, many of our early hypotheses about how useful these things are or what they would require to be able to reach massive adoption and scale were, were actually pretty narrow and incorrect. And so I guess what I put back to the group as part of this presentation is that I know, you know when we think about social media, most of what we think about are you know, funny cat photos or the fact that you can look at photos of an ex-boyfriend or somebody you went to high school with. 
But what we're finding out in the space in which I work is that social media data can in fact be used to improve social service delivery and save lives. And then I hope over the course of this presentation, that idea moves from being a theoretical concept to one that actually you may consider as a real thing that we're doing in, uh, today. And so when we started work in Data for Good, um, specifically on disaster mapping, we had some early questions. Um, and the first set of questions that we had were around the data itself. So we recognize that in times of natural disaster, administrative data, um, and as Jeb said, you know, real-time information about structures, real-time information about communication systems, all of these things are really hard because we might be, re be relying on things like census data or administrative data, but those things are often no longer the case if populations are moving or if telecommunications are down or if power is out. So we were trying to figure out is what does Facebook have to offer in this space of real-time information that could fill critical gaps um, in the first hours of a crisis. But equally as important to that, we wondered, can we share this information with the right people at the right time to protect privacy? I think it's probably worth noting that I actually sit within Facebook's privacy team and I report to our chief data protection officer. So data for good goes nowhere if we don't have a privacy by design approach. And we had to really strongly consider those questions when we thought about uh, the task before us in terms of how to share data to save lives. So on the data question, um, I actually think it's great that Jeb's presentation sort of teed up the importance of location-enabled data because this is what we realized was an untapped holy grail, so to speak. Again, a lot of people, when they think social media data, they think text data, they think photos. But a lot of people forget that if you use an application on your mobile phone, many of those applications have location services enabled. Facebook does, Google Map does, Uber does, Lyft does. Anywhere you're getting local recommendations or there's a local nature to the app, there's typically a location service enabled. And so using location services, we can figure out essentially what is real-time population density. So where are people before the crisis and where are they after? And that can tell you very important things about evacuation, that can tell you where people are sheltering in place, and we knew that was valuable. At the same time, if you can get on Facebook at all, this is a really helpful proxy for whether or not telecommunications are up or down. Because guess what? If you can get on Facebook, that means that the network coverage in your area is functioning. Um, and if you see a sharp decline in people able to access Facebook, and you see a sharp decline in people um, you know, pinging their sort of cell tower locations by, by virtue of, of connecting to Facebook, then you may be able to extrapolate that certain cell towers are down. Power availability. This is a hard one, but this was one that we are sort of continuing to play in, and it has a lot to do with whether or not you can tell um, whether or not devices can be charged. So we can't see this for all devices, but there are certain types of phones that if we see a sharp decline in the proportions of, of those phones that are able to receive a, a charge by location, that that could be a decent proxy for whether or not power was available. Safety check. Um, this is something many of you are probably familiar with. Fa uh, Facebook has a feature called safety check that when you're in a disaster affected area allows you to check in safe um, and tell your family and friends that you're okay. And what if we could aggregate that information by location and if we found that there were big neighborhoods where lots of people had checked in safe or lots of people failed to check in safe, what could that tell us about areas of potential risk? And finally, long-term displacement. Um, what we've realized over so the past year and a half is that there aren't just issues of early evacuations that uh, organizations need to better understand, but what about, you know, in situations like Hurricane Maria, uh, or more recently the, uh, the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia that experienced a horrible earthquake, are there weeks and months of, of recovery that, you know, we need to observe in terms of people just never being able to return home because there's been such extreme devastation that, that neighborhoods and towns remain uninhabited? And, and what can we say, again, using aggregated location service data about uh, the incidence of long-term displacement? So these are the things we learned early on about the power that our data could have. But what about the privacy question? Well, we figured out that we could solve it. Um, and it uses techniques that are not that complicated. So we decided that we were gonna focus on aggregation as the first technique that we would use. One thing that's really powerful about Facebook data is that it's information at scale. And we decided that we weren't gonna be building tools for individual search and rescue. We were gonna be trying to build tools that told you about how populations at large we're evacuating, again, at, at a neighborhood level, whether or not people were sheltering in place, because that to us seemed to be one of the biggest gaps, is how, you can, how can you tell what's going on at scale using a platform like ours? And so what we decided to do through disaster maps was to aggregate all the data points that we had from location services into tiles that were 600 meters on a side, which is bigger than a house, but you know, 
a, a roughly a small neighborhood in size. And then whenever we had very low population counts, similar to what the census does, we would smooth the count of people in that tile with nearby tiles. And so the, the main technique, of course, we use is aggregation and smoothing. But we also focused on the fact that we wanted to build tools that people could use. We didn't want to make it about data sharing. So what we focused on was a co-development process with partners that we trusted. As Re Rebecca uh, alluded to, we required data sharing agreements for anybody we, we, we work with. But then once a data sharing agreement is signed, we actually go into a sort of feedback process with our various partners. And that's how we build our maps. Um, and we think that this is really important because it not only helps protect privacy when you're sharing inf information in a map format, it's arguably more privacy protecting than a CSV file, but it also allows for better insight sharing. So it's interesting because a lot of people think that those things are often in conflict, you know, privacy preservation and, and, and you know, unique granular insights. But what we found is that they're actually complementary for our purposes, and that was exciting to know as well. So I'm going to walk you through a bunch of examples of how Disaster Maps has been uh, deployed in, in the US and US territories over the last year and a half. And again, I think what's really exciting about this work is that in June of uh, last year when we launched, there was a lot of sort of theoretical uh, exercises we were going through. How might our data be useful? Could it be useful in these con contexts? And what we found over the last year and a half is that we've gone from a very theoretical research approach um, to the work that we're doing, to having real operational impact. Uh, this year's hurricane season, we were using our maps over and over again, not just in the US, but globally. And we've been able to get to a place where we found that our data really can have an impact in the way services are delivered. So starting with Hurricane Maria, which many of you, I'm sure, are engaged with, um, we started by trying to figure out what could we say about the proportion of people that were using Facebook and how this could impact not only telecommunication restoration, but the way um, people were receiving information as aid on the island of Puerto Rico. So unsurprisingly, this is a map of people using Facebook um, on uh, uh, the island of Puerto Rico two days before Maria, and it's, it's a pretty sort of normal distribution. We're not seeing huge upticks in, in places where we wouldn't expect to see people using Facebook. And then this is three weeks after Maria, where you see anywhere that's red is really a sharp decline in, in the number of people using Facebook, higher than we would expect to see if it were normal circumstances. And then eight weeks after Maria, as anyone who engaged in this disaster knows, there's still sort of large scale outages in terms of telecommunications and power, and you're still seeing a lot fewer people using Facebook than you would expect. Now, what does this actually mean from an operational perspective? Well, we were able to make network coverage maps that were used by um, the American Red Cross and by NetHope um, to try to figure out where the best places to position Wi-Fi hotspots were um, and where to position uh, reunification sites. So you can see here, uh, it's pretty bad connectivity throughout the island, but when we shared this information with the Red Cross and with NetHope, they were still able to use that information combined with other um, indices, whether or not it's social vulnerability indices, um, indices of where people are located in terms of real-time population density, and deploy Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, both the American Red Cross and, and NetHope deployed over 100 to the island by figuring out where the most um, beneficial places to have those hotspots would be, connecting the most people possible where it was needed most. Not only was this information used, again, for telecommunication restoration, but when we were able to see where people were able to access Facebook, we were able to figure out that Facebook can be used as a communication tool in those areas. And so using this information, NetHope launched an information as aid campaign in the form of a Facebook page. Um, and what they did was they actually worked with a local uh, news agency called Internews, and they trained its 12 citizen reporters to be able to tell stories from the island of Puerto Rico and then share that with the wider world. And that was such an effective engagement that um, pretty much overnight the Facebook page grew faster than you know, many others in history, reached 1.3 million users, and was able to garner support from the international community and the Puerto Rican diaspora in particular because it was relying on use of Facebook as a communication tool, which we knew we could use because of the data we uh, empowered the nonprofits to, to make use of. So that's one example from, uh, from last year. Jumping to some more recent examples, uh, Hurricane Florence again, which I'm sure many of you worked on. Um, this is a map that was made by one of our partners named Direct Relief, who um, coordinates with the health system. And they are always trying to coordinate uh, with health centers in particular to show um, real-time information on how populations are evacuating. And so what Direct Relief did was they actually showed um, daily updates using disaster maps data 
from before the hurricane made landfall to when uh, the hurricane made landfall to then after and share this information with health centers to tell them whether or not um, certain particular health centers would see an uptick in, in populations headed that way and as a result maybe where they should up staff and preposition supplies. So this will run kind of quickly but anywhere that's red along the coast is where you see sharp declines in population and anywhere that's blue is where you see sharp increases in population. And they were able, again, to share this information on a daily basis with the health system. Um, we also have a partner named Humanity Road who collaborates with uh, many of the USG counterparts in the room. And they were also sharing this real-time location data to monitor um, how evacuations had proceeded because, as many of you know, um, there were mandatory evacuations a few days before the hurricane made landfall. And they were able to show daily snapshots of uh, the proportion of population that had left as well as the proportion of population using our maps that seemed to be sheltering in place. And they shared that with um, not only the Carolinas as well as FEMA. Um, jumping to Hurricane Michael, again, another major storm this year, um, our data was used in a very similar way. So this is yet another map that shows actually the power of Facebook data when it's used um, not on its own but as a layer. So the blue and red dots are again where we're seeing sharp decreases and increases in population. But then um, the gray uh, polygons are um, sh basically sh showing high levels of CDC vulnerability. Um, and then these orange locations are the locations of health centers. So again, trying to use our information as sort of the real-time input to what health centers may need to know about how populations are moving. Um, in this particular disaster, the American Red Cross also used um, a data set that I haven't yet mentioned, but we recently rolled out maps using our community health tool. So community health is another one of our platform tools that actually allows populations affected by natural disaster to post um, that they need particular supplies. So there are categories like food, shelter, um, baby supplies. And we're able to aggregate those requests on a map, and the American Red Cross has used that multiple times for their distribution plan. So if you see a sharp increase you know, of baby supplies needed in, in a particular district, you know actually how to send supplies to particular shelter locations. And, and that was one data set they used in this, in this crisis as well. Um, and last but not least, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, you know, the horrible wildfires uh, that you know, are still devastating California. Um, but again, we were able to use our um, data in this particular circumstance to figure out, again, how evacuations had proceeded. So this was interesting. We got a call from Cal OES that um, they were wondering, you know, we know that people are moving, but we don't actually see that many people in shelters. So can you just tell us where people who are from the evacuation zone, where you, where you think they ended up so we could just have a better understanding of where people may be staying with family and friends? And so this is our disaster map for, for that crisis. This is paradise where many people left. And you can see multiple parts of Chico. There was a sharp, sharp increase in population there. Oroville is another town to the south. Um, and there are other towns that aren't pictured here, Chapman Town, um, Sterling uh, as well. And we were able to tell them, you know, this is where we're seeing the, sh the, the sharpest uptick in, in population. And you can, you, know, you can be assured at least that big chunks of the population got out are just staying with family and friends and don't expect them unnecessarily to show up at your shelters. Um, this information was also used to send out uh, over 10,000 respiratory masks because, again, when you have a better sense of where people are headed, you can tell where you need supplies more. Um, so I bring up these examples hopefully to show that um, when we think about social media data, hopefully we've, you know, potentially, I know it's been a, a short uh, presentation, but over the course of this conversation, I hope that we can move from a place of thinking about it as a tool that we use to purely communicate with family and friends, but potentially as a tool that can be used um, not only from a product perspective to deliver, deliver services, but potentially through data sharing with communities like yours. Um, and, and through use of social media in that way, potentially, we really can do good together uh, and save lives. And uh, just to talk about some of the results that we've had, uh, we went from starting with about half a dozen partners uh, June of last year to working with over 30, of which NAPSIG is now one. And so we look forward to um, hearing from you all who are a part of the sort of NAPSIG network, how we can use that partnership to, to share these insights with, with many of you in the room. Um, just to note, we are a global company at Facebook, not just a domestic company. So um, in addition to the disasters that I spoke about, we've also activated for many of the other large-scale international disasters this year, including the flooding in Kerala, India, India which um, led to this displacement of over a million people, uh, the volcanic eruption in Guatemala in June of this year, as well as the uh, earthquake in Sulawesi in uh, Indonesia. And I think... 
that is the end of my slides. But again, just to uh, sort of close out, uh, I just want to say thank you all uh, for having me, first of all. I know that uh, having a face from Facebook here isn't necessarily uh, the cleanest fit, but you know we do do a ton of work in this space, and it's, a, it's an honor to be uh, a member of this community. And also just to uh, hopefully throughout the course of the day, maybe uh, talk to as many of you as possible. I'd love to get feedback on the work that we're doing, um, hear from you all how these insights can be useful, and hopefully over the course of the next six months to a year, partner with you guys to, uh, to use our data to improve the way services are delivered and hopefully save lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And um, I think this is a nice opportunity for our folks. If anybody has any questions, we've got a couple of microphones. I see one question from right here in the white shirt, please. Hi, this is Daniel from Oregon. Um, so a quick question for you. What is your threshold for activating Facebook emergency response? It's a really good question, uh, a very thoughtful one. So uh, basically the way it works, there's two ways a disaster map can be generated. One is that we get an alert from an international alerting framework called NC4, and that back end says, you know, there's a hurricane coming. And then we actually go through a couple threshold requirements on our side, basically, to figure out if Facebook data is going to be su of sufficient like richness uh, to be able to generate a meaningful map. And so right now, the threshold we're using is that if 7,000 people check in safe, um, that kicks off a disaster map. There's another way to do it, which is basically a manual process where, you know, sometimes there are natural disasters where um, not that many people check in safe and real-time information is still needed. So there is a two-way opportunity um, when we work with partners. Um, like I just kicked off a bounding box for the ongoing, uh, we created a bunch of maps for this, uh, Ebola outbreak in DRC. And that's a tough one because there's not nearly as widespread use of social media, uh, social media at all in DRC, but you know where we even hope our, our data can have um, an impact will sometimes generate a manual map as well. Part of the benefit of the data sharing agreement that we let with you is that yep. we'll be able to extend access to some of that data in an event yep. and some of the maps through NAPSIG so that you're not trying to negotiate a data sharing agreement directly with yeah. Facebook. So the, the sort of quick and dirty on um, how our partnerships work is that anybody can share a map. So if you guys want NAPSIG to make a map with just Facebook data, I'm not, I don't want to sign you guys up for work, but uh, you know, NAPSIG is in a position to share maps um, really at, at any time with you all. The only uh, time we need a direct relationship is if you need like to be able to make your own maps and you think that you're going to be activating um, over and over again. And so these are the, you know, the red crosses of the world um, who activate, you know, every day for natural disasters. And so um, I, we're hopeful that the, the relationship with NAPSIC can get you, you know, 90% of the way there in terms of the information that you need. And we have one, one question back here in the red. Um, what is your point of contact? How can we connect with you or your team? Uh, you can email me. Uh, I didn't put my email up there, but it's lmcgorman at fb.com. First initial, last name. Any other questions for Laura from folks in the room? Travis Hardy, Contract Support to DHS. Uh, first of all, great presentation. Uh, really love all of the data services that you guys have been providing at the aggregate level uh, for population distribution. It's been fantastic to see that growth and usage. Um, kind of want to flip the script a little bit. Um, many businesses have Facebook uh, pages themselves. And so I was wondering if there are any plans for an opt-in strategy for businesses to be able to allow Facebook to publish their status, open and close, needs, yeah. n unmet needs. Um, this would be tremendously helpful for resiliency in times of disaster, making sure that we're placing uh, logistical items in areas that are of critical need versus those that may a community has come back up. So I was just curious if you had any thoughts on kind of where you might be headed there. Yeah, this, is, this, um, this idea has come up uh, multiple times. So I think Humanity Road actually shared this idea with me. So the idea that like, could you sort of the way people check in safe, toggle at a business page level that you're temporarily closed. I'm gonna have to do my homework because that functionality may exist in a passive format already, 
but there's not, necess there's not yet sort of a notification-based uh, type alert that goes out to Facebook pages the way it does for safety check at the individual level. And I think what we're hearing from the business community is like, is there almost a push notification that you could get to say like, hey, my business is closed or hey, my business is open during the time of a natural disaster. So um, certainly something I can reiterate has come up more than once uh, on the product side. Thanks. Yeah. That's an excellent question. I think that gets to actually potentially filling some gaps in information that's needed to yeah. to yeah. run dashboards on against some yep. of the lifelines. So really useful ideas. I have time for one more question. I don't know if there's any any burning questions for Laura at this point. Um, not seeing any hands. I want to say thank you so much. Oh, no, and you. we really look forward to your ideas. So feel free to come up to any of us over the course of the rest of today and into tomorrow. If you have any ideas of things you'd like to be able to do, because we really want to want to move our partnership forward and, and make it beneficial to all of you. So Laura, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.